discussions and get the door shut. We're going to start here in two minutes. We'll now call Natural Resource uh, Committee meeting to order. Uh, we welcome everyone to the meeting, and at this time, I'd like for you to ask, stand, and join me with the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the, to the flag, flag of the United States, States of America and, and to the republic for which it stands, one, one nation, nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. I'd like to to welcome each of you this morning and a uh, special welcome to my intern. I'd like to ask uh, Carly Watts to stand up. Uh, Carly's joining me today from, from Hazard, Kentucky. Her grandfather was our county judge when I was a kid and probably did more to sort of change our region uh, than any judge I can remember at that time. And he was a Republican, which was really different for us in Eastern Kentucky. When you consider, I, I didn't see a Republican until I was 14 years old, but uh, he was really a visionary fellow and, and very, very involved. And so it's nice to see his, his, his granddaughter participating at it. And I'm sure that Carol Fugit would be very, very proud to see you today. But welcome to our committee and thanks for helping us out today. Do I have any other members that have special guests today? We have anybody that would like to, to introduce that you have? All right, with that said, we're going to go just a little bit out of order because I've got some members. Oh, sorry, I need to do uh, roll calls. At this, let me ask the clerk to call the roll, please. Senator Carpenter. Here. Senator Caslin, Senator Embry. Senator Harper Angel. Here. Senator Schickel. Here. Senator Southworth. Here. Senator Webb. Here. Senator Westerfield. Here. Senator Wheeler. Senator Turner. Chair Smith. All right, we have quorum. Uh, since we don't need to approve our minutes, we can go ahead and get uh, started into our meeting. We're going to go a little bit out of order because I have some members that have to go to another meeting. So I'd like to ask uh, Senator Mills if he'll go ahead and come to the table. <clears throat> Senator Mills, do you have any other guests speaking online or? Okay, yeah, if you'll turn your mic on for us, and we'll turn it over to you. Just please have your guests introduce themselves for our records. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, it's, it's, I'm glad to be here today. Uh, I'm Robbie Mills. I represent the 4th Senate District in Northwest Kentucky, and I'll allow my guest, uh, Treasurer Ball, to introduce herself. And Mr. Chairman, Allison Ball, Kentucky State Treasurer. Mr. Chairman, Brian Cantrell uh, with Alliance Resource Partners. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, uh, today we have uh, before you uh, Senate Bill 205. Uh, Senate Bill 205 is uh, a very timely bill, to be quite honest with you. Uh, you don't have to look far uh, in our nation to see uh, the effects that energy, uh, energy policy, proper uh, management of energy policy, and improper management of energy policy is doing uh, to our country. Uh, to be quite honest with you, the, the activism that we've seen uh, around this subject uh, through the Obama years and especially the last two years here uh, is uh, just amazing to me. Uh, pro progressive ideology is really seeping in and uh, affecting energy policy in many, many, many different ways. And we are going to talk about uh, one of those ways that uh, this ideology is slipping in. Uh, Senator Mills, if I could, uh, you have a sub. Do you want to adopt, get a motion I do. to adopt yeah, the sub? Yeah, we do have a sub. So you can speak to that. We have a motion and a second. Uh, all those in favor of the sign of aye. Opposed, likewise. Now we can go ahead and talk about your subs. I Thank apologize. you. Thank you so much. So uh, just want to touch on uh, <clears throat> what Senate Bill uh, 205 does and some of the background uh, related to this. Uh, you know, energy production is vital to Kentucky's economy. 
Thousands, thousands of Kentuckians depend upon jobs in the coal, oil, and gas industries. Uh, fossil fuels provide uh, reliable and affordable energy, but unfortunately there are progressive ideologies and attacks out there against fossil fuel industry uh, that are going on almost daily. Uh, major banks and investment firms are denying lending to and investments in fossil fuel companies in the effort to promote the green, green investments and political agendas. Uh, more than 101 banks, this is pretty amazing, more, more than 101 banks have joined the Net Zero Banking Alliance uh, that was uh, convened just last year. Uh, these banks have endorsed policies to dramatically cut their investments in fossil fuels companies by 2030 and to limit access to capital for companies that do not share their commitment to a net zero carbon emissions uh, standard. Simply put, they're starving uh, capital from cost-effective uh, energy uh, resources in Kentucky, and it seeks to eliminate fossil fuel industry, increases energy costs for hardworking Kentuckians, and destroys the energy production around the world. Energy policies, in my opinion, uh, should be created by us, by the legislators in Kentucky, not in the boardrooms of publicly traded banks and investment firms around the uh, nation and country uh, and, and the world. Senate Bill 205 makes it clear that Kentucky stands with our fossil fuels company and Kentuckians who work hard every day to produce these low-cost uh, resources and power for our nation. Here's a, a few highlights of what Senate Bill 2 will do, and then I'll allow my guests to comment on how uh, this uh, is affecting uh, their areas of expertise. Uh, Senate Bill 205 requires the Kentucky State Treasurer, right to my right, uh, to do two things. To maintain a list of financial companies who are boycotting the energy industry. And number two, it's to share that list with state government entities making investments of more than a million dollars annually. It allows the Treasurer to request written confirmation from a, fi from a financial company to certify that they have policies discriminating against fossil fuel companies. It requires state government entities to notify the treasurer of any holdings that they have with financial companies uh, on the list and provide the financial companies an opportunity to actually clarify their activities or to cease those activities. Uh, if a financial company does not cease uh, the boycotting activities, the state government entity shall divest from those holdings. Now, divesting is not a requirement uh, if reasonable evidence shows that divesting from the special financial, uh, uh, from the specific financial company would cause state government entities to suffer a loss, and I think that's a very, very important part. Uh, contracts between state government entities and companies of 10 or more full-time employees uh, must contain a written verification in those contracts that says uh, this company does not uh, boycott energy companies. So that's just a brief introduction on Senate Bill 205. I will allow Treasurer Ball here to speak to her activities uh, prior to this bill and then going how, th how she would uh, activate this bill. Thank you very much. Um, Mr. Chairman, as you know, I'm in Eastern Kentucky and I'm ninth generation from Floyd County. So this is an area that I am well versed in and I've been in this space for a long time. Uh, from my office, I've written numerous letters. I've written a letter to the banking industry uh, indicating that the state really is paying attention to issues like this. We want to protect signature industries. I've written comments to the Department of Labor and the OCC, uh, pushing back against aggressive efforts from the Biden administrations to really target the traditional energy fields. So let me tell you why this is important right now. Uh, number one, these are signature industries of Kentucky. You know, I know this from my home area, but if you're in West Kentucky, you know this, and it really impacts the entire state. And that's why this is very important right now, because these are signature industries that need to be protected. And number two, this is a response to aggressive actions from the federal level. It's not just the private sector that is indicating what they want to do, and the private sector has a lot of authority to do that, but this is really an answer to what's happening in D.C. And that's why I've been so involved. And the reason why this is important statutorily is because I've only 
only got two years left in my term. You know, I can do this while I'm here, but there may not be a champion for these signature industries when I'm gone. And this will make sure that there is still a champion for these signature industries. And this is also important for our country. You know, we need cheap energy. Uh, it's good for us in Kentucky. It puts us economically in a sound position, but it's good for us as a nation. And then uh, I think very important right now, we see what's happening in Europe. We see what's happening with Ukraine. Uh, and that is being directly impacted by the fact that we are actually still using a lot of energy from Russia. Uh, and that should scare everybody and that should motivate everybody that we want to make sure we are energy independent. We heard the president say last night we should buy more American. And we, I believe that's actually correct. We should buy more American energy. And this is one of those ways to do that. We need to protect our Kentucky industries that protect our energy for our state, for our country and, and really the world. Mr. Chairman, we have uh, with us Brian Cantrell. He is uh, uh, chief, off uh, chief financial officer for Alliance Resources. Alliance Resources has uh, well over a thousand miners still in my district, a uh, large, huge uh, coal producer in the state of Kentucky. I'd like for him to address just uh, for a moment how this could positively affect them and how, uh, without it, the consequences that they face. Thank you. Uh, good morning. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and members of the committee. Uh, by way of a bit of background, Alliance is a publicly traded, diversified natural resource company that generates operating and royalty income from coal produced by its mining operations in Kentucky, Indiana, Illinois, Maryland, and West Virginia. We also generate royalty income from mineral interests we own in premier oil and gas producing regions across the U.S. Currently, we are the second largest coal producer in the eastern United States. Our Kentucky footprint includes our operational headquarters in Lexington, three coal operations, Riverview Coal and Warrior Coal in western Kentucky, along with Excel Mining in East Kentucky. Additionally, Alliance has manufacturing and rebuild facilities in western Kentucky to support our coal operations. In 2021 alone, Alliance operations employed over 1,600 workers in the state and provided a $1.1 billion economic impact uh, for Kentucky. For more than 20 years, Alliance operations have provided low-cost, reliable fuel to power Kentucky's homes and businesses. Today, I rise in support of Senate Bill 205. I would personally like to thank Senator Mills and Chairman Smith for their great work on this important legislation. Alliance is proud of the role that we play in delivering low-cost, reliable energy critical to the economic well-being standard of living and quality of life that allows the communities we serve to flourish. We're also aware of the need to pursue new energy and power technologies so that Alliance can continue to be a vital participant in the country's energy future. It's no secret that energy production is capital intensive and it requires ongoing support from our financial institutions. Alliance has enjoyed long-standing relationships with our inst institutions, many stretching back for decades. These relationships are the result of our lengthy track record of strong financial and operating performance and our commitment to faithfully fulfill our obligations, all while maintaining the industry's strongest balance sheet. Recently, America's fossil fuels industries have experienced a significant pardon me, negative shift in the willingness of financial institutions to support our businesses. We have encountered it firsthand. Despite an impeccable balance sheet and surging worldwide demand for the resources the men and women of Alliance work tires, tirelessly to produce, financial institutions that have partnered with us for years are signaling their intent to limit our access to capital by either reducing the amount of capital available to us or by only allowing their capital be, to be used for non-fossil fuel activities. Their reasoning has nothing to do with our financial performance. Instead, it is due to discrimination against fossil fuels. They can see they are under tremendous pressure from vocal stakeholders to use their resources to advance a net zero carbon emission goal. Let me repeat that. Their decision has absolutely nothing to do with our financial performance. Instead, they are increasingly boycotting our industry in an effort to force a premature and unsustainably fast transition to renewable resources. This is affecting every aspect of our financial world, impacting access to costs and costs associated with commercial bank lending equity and debt capital markets, insurance underwriters, and surety providers. Senator Mills mentioned the 101 banks, who, by the way, have $67 trillion in assets that joined the Net Zero Banking Alliance convened by the UN in April of 2021. Members of that group include institutions you are all familiar with, Bank of America, Citi, 
J.P. Morgan Chase, Goldman Sachs, and Wells Fargo, to name just a few. They have all endorsed policies to dramatically cut their investment in fossil fuel companies by 2030 and to limit access to capital for companies who produce fossil fuels needed to protect America's standard of living today. Put simply, major U.S. financial institutions have decided that they, not you, as legislators will dictate state, local, national, and global energy policy by limiting access to uh, fossil fuel companies. They show no concern for the devastation their decisions will render. If we, if I, I, you've got a motion and a second on your bill. Uh, oh, so okay. I'm, I'm, I don't want to tell you how to trade horses, but that's probably a pretty good position to be in. I, know I, I didn't hear. I'll, be, I'll, I'll, I'll stop do, now. Uh, Thank you. Yeah, so you, you're, you're winning. <laughs> uh, we do have I, stop I think, your head. Yeah, two other people that uh, I think wanted to speak on this, if they would like to quickly. Um, uh, Ballard Cassidy, Ballard, do you want to do, do you want to come to the table and speak? And uh, I think on deck we may have uh, Tom Fitzgerald. If you want to, I don't know if you want to speak on this or not. But uh, Mr. Chairman, I, hi, uh, thank you very much. I have not talked to uh, Senator Mills about the bill, and so I'm I'm not here to provide testimony. I will be happy to answer any questions uh, that you have uh, regarding the bill, regarding its premise, and regarding. Uh, the impact of the bill, uh, but because we have not had a chance to talk beforehand, I, I, I you know, I'm, I'm reluctant to uh, to provide much substantive testimony. Um, but I'm happy to answer any questions. Good, yeah, thank you, Val. We'll turn it over to you and any of your guests if they'll just identify themselves for the record. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, my name is Ballard Cassidy, and to my left is Deborah Stamper, and to my right is uh, Ballard. Please turn your mic on if you care. We're, we can't hear you, my friend. There you go. Thank you. There you go. My name is Ballard Cassidy. I'm president of KBA, Kentucky Bankers Association. To my left is Deborah Stamper, who is the executive vice president and general counsel for the KBA. And to my right is John Cooper, our government relations consultant. Um, I appreciate the opportunity to be here today to speak on House Bill 205. Uh, I also uh, am a native son of Kentucky's coal country, and I can even beat uh, Treasurer Ball. I'm from Pike County, not Floyd County. I'm <laughs> even a little further east, but uh, I have uh, I was born and raised in Pikeville. Uh, I've watched coal mine from my earliest memories, uh, some of it by my family and some of it on my family's land. Uh, I'll tell you, as the president of a community bank there, I saw the coal industry sustain our economy and livelihood of our customers and our friends. I've hated the misguided policies that have blighted not just this industry, but also the communities and families that it's sustained. In short, I share the frustration that prompted Senate Bill 205, but yet here I am to speak against it. I'm here to say that Senate Bill 205 is not the answer. If enacted, it will be a treatment that is more deadly than the disease because it strikes at the very heart of our free market enterprise principles. Here in Senate Bill 205, we have the government dictating to private businesses who they can and cannot do business with by the mandatory choking off of their access to capital, an action that was first tried and defeated in the Obama administration under Operation Choke Point. Congress knew then that it, uh, that's a line that we can't cross without creating a president that we will live to regret. It's a line most recently confirmed by the U.S. Supreme Court in 2018 in the case of Masterpiece Cake Shop versus Colorado Civil Rights Commission with the ruling that the government should stay out of the business of telling private businesses who they can or cannot do business with. Senate Bill 205, however, is doing just that in a way that I struggle to wrap my mind around, quite frankly. It pits the banking industry against the government entities, uh, both of which uh, are uh, the, against government entities, which are our customers. Uh, that's a lose-lose that's a scenario in part because it treats financial institutions as the problem. It treats us as the villain. Senate Bill 205 requires that the Treasurer uh, to compile what I will call a blacklist of, pu of publicly traded financial institutions who engage in the energy company boycotting. What engaging in energy company boycotting is, 
isn't perfectly clear even after multiple readings of the proposed definition, but a financial institution can be presumed to have engaged in it if the treasurer does not receive a timely affirmation of a financial institution's activities. Those blacklisted institutions are then communicated to the governmental entities, which are prohibited from entering into and are required to get out of $100,000 and higher contracts and keep from having investments in those companies that could include the simple act of stock ownership. This approach to the problem ignores some realities and runs a high risk of unintended consequences by the legislature. First, we should acknowledge that there are no evil actors here. Financial institutions are simply heavily regulated businesses operating within a free market system. Some financial institutions may be limiting their dealings in fossil fuels, but the reasons may not be a simple choice. Often, regulators have pressured those decisions for concentration of liabilities or balance sheet issues. Some occasions, on some occasions, the pressures are coming from shareholders. Publicly traded financial institutions have a fiduciary duty to their shareholders and an operational duty to their regulators. Banks can find themselves between the proverbial rock and hard, pla and hard place and, uh, quite easily. This current trend may or may not last, but more government intrusion into private business decision is certainly not the remedy. While some banks are choosing to limit their relationships with fossil fuel companies, there's no evidence these fossil fuel companies are not finding other financial institutions who will welcome them in. For state government, there are existing contracts between government entities and publicly traded financial institutions currently which this bill could force to be terminated, resulting in possible penalties and costly transfers to other financial institutions and the Commonwealth. Depending upon the number of financial institutions that the Treasurer adds to the blacklist and the size of the contract that's involved, government entities may not be able to find other eligible financial institutions to take over their business. Limiting who government entities can do business with is in direct contravention to their procurement responsibilities which can leave the entities in a confusing place of a decision-making. Passage of Senate Bill 205 will undoubtedly result in lawsuits, which will place both the government entities and the financial institutions in a precarious balance of complying with legal and regulatory compliance, regulatory orders, court orders, and legitimate business decisions. The worst I fear, the absolute worst I fear, is this bill sets a precedent for other groups to seek protection against financial institutions or other legal businesses. That feeds a growing and unhealthy trend to legislate against anything and everything that whoever is sitting in your chair at any point in time in the future doesn't agree with. Finally, and perhaps most importantly, Senate Bill 205 may cause government entities to violate their fiduciary responsibilities. A fiduciary responsibility is the highest and perhaps the most re uh, revered responsibility under U.S. law. It is the assurance to each Kentuckian that the government is looking out for their best interest and that the tax money that we all pay to the government, uh, uh, coffers, will be spent and invested in such a way as to result in the highest and best use and benefit to the citizenry. I could. We've, we've got a couple of questions and, and sure. an effort of time Rock to and make fire. sure everybody can get it. We, <laughs> okay. pre we appreciate your presentation sure. for having to, to, to cut you off there a little bit. Uh, Senator Wheeler has a question or a comment that he'd like to ask. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. You know, and I, and I can somewhat understand Mr. Cassidy's concerns, but, you know, does the banking industry not bear some responsibility for creating this situation by these massive mergers that have created these behemoths of, uh, that are really responsible to no one, uh, I mean, and uh, in many ways are led by people out of New York City and places like that that generally don't respect the values and the principles of people that are, are their depositors and, and things like that. You have an increasing number of large banks that squeeze uh, small guys out of the way through acquisitions and other things, which have left local community businesses with uh, much more limited uh, options with availability for capital. So, I mean, I, I do understand your concerns, but 
you know, have, has the banking industry also not been part of the problem here? All right. Uh, I would answer that by saying that the banking industry, like any business, uh, is, a, is a private business and it's privately owned. And I've never known a bank get acquired that said no. Uh, so its stockholders had to agree to it before it ever got acquired. And yes, there's a ton of murders going on. I think when I first got in the banking business, there was 25,000 banks in the United States. I think today there's 7,000, maybe 6,000. So you're right, the number has, has, has grown. But a lot of that is caused by regulatory cost. It has nothing to do with whether or not an individual bank wants to keep their doors open. It has more to do with the government regulations that they're piling upon the smaller banks who cannot afford to go out and hire the type of people that they need to hire in order to uh, manage the compliance regulations that are put on them. Brief follow-up, and I, and I don't necessarily disagree with you there, and I do believe that, that you do make a valid point. Um, you know, on the other hand, you know, with the repeal of Glass-Steagall and some of the uh, protective issues that kind of separated market banks from consumer banks, mm -hmm. we've seen these increasing mergers since that time and also these, uh, I guess, more political activism within the banking community. Um, you know, is that, again, I mean, to some degree, and I can understand your concerns, but have, have the banks that very much lobbied for the repeal of those acts create a part of the problem? Well, and I, if we could, we actually, we have some other questions. I think that's more of a comment, if it could. A so, rhetorical question. Yeah, yeah. If okay. we could, uh, have the <laughs> Senator question. Southworth, Fair if she question. would like to go ahead at the time. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And I'll preface this, because I certainly don't want to be helping those who would want to harm us. When I'm trying to figure out the definition of us, and I was actually looking at doing something along these lines relating to public finance and states' investment decisions and things, and as you were talking just now, I got a little bit confused because you were talking about the private market. So are you suggesting or saying this bill equally treats state decisions for, and public entity decisions as it does private private or is there some kind of differentiation you can see there yeah I, th I think I understand your question and if I'm not answering it just tell me uh, the way the way the, the, the bill is 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 written in a manner where it's the state deciding who they want to do business with and who they don't want to do business with which I think is fantastic I was telling uh, Treasurer Ball out in the hallway, I was, uh, you know, she signed a letter. She pinned her name to a letter that went to uh, all the major banks in the country that said, Kentucky will not do business with you if you don't do business with Kentucky. It was that simple. Where the state gets involved in private business is when they choke off access to the capital that the state provides to that industry, through whether it's through investments uh, if the state treasurer buys a mutual fund, inside that mutual fund, I think I keep hearing the word Citibank and Wells Fargo today, but I'm sure inside that mutual fund there's stock on Citibank and Wells Fargo. Now there is a, a cottage industry running around today getting started up called Green Funds, where they've taken all the uh, uh, the 101 list I think the gentleman mentioned earlier uh, out. But the way this bill is written, uh, this would allow the state to cut capital off to any business. It, it, it specifically talks about fossil fuel in this one. But tomorrow, it could be to gun dealers. The day after that, it could be you don't get an insurance license if you don't own a gun. The day after that, it can be we don't issue bank charters if you've ever had an abortion. Uh, social issues have no place whatsoever inside inside uh, uh, the private sector, including banks. It, social issues have no place in their decisions at all. I, and I would agree with that part of it. Okay, but could we have a motion and a second on the bill? Uh, I know there's probably still some comments, but people have a chance to explain their vote. This time I'll ask the clerk to call the roll. <clears throat> Senator Carpenter. Can I explain my vote, Mr. Uh, 
this commit this almost feels like banking and insurance committee. I'm kind of <laughs> I'm kind of used to this crowd, to be honest with you. I started but, to start out, uh, Senator Carver, by saying I I used to kill hogs when I was young on my daddy's farm, and I sort of know how they felt now. That's right. <laughs> that's right. Well, sometimes you don't always kill them; you just scare them to make them eat more, so you can kill them a little later on. So. Uh, <laughs> Uh, <laughs> I, some people caught that joke, I think. But, you know, I guess the reason I'm going to explain my yes vote, but, you know, I think that this is just an encouragement, Ballard, as you know, with our industry and what we're talking about is, you know, I, I don't think we can tell people what to do or not to do, whether we agree or disagree with that. I don't think that's the role of what we're going to try to do. But we also want to encourage people to make sure they do business with us if they want to do business do business with us. You know, those saying with me is in my business, if, if you don't trade with me, why in the world would I want to trade with you? And exactly. so I think this is just sure. an opportunity to encourage folks that, Hey, we appreciate the opportunity to do business with you, but we want you to do the same. And if you're telling people that, that you're not going to finance opportunities that are one of our biggest industries and provides affordable energy, then, Hey, we want, we're going to take a harder look at you. I don't think the bill no way says that we can't do business with them. It just says that we would like to make that decision and have the ability to, to kind of evaluate doing business with them. And, you know, this is going to, this is the first step of this process, as you well know, I don't have to explain it to you. And so I think this kind of helps create a, a, a shot over the bow, as they say, mm -hmm. to kind of make sure everybody understands what we're trying to do and the, the intentions of, of, of what, why we're wanting to protect our industry. Yes. Oh, I'm, I don't know if it's a yes or a no. To be, no, I said yes. <laughs> it's, a, it's a Buford yes. That's right. <laughs> Senator Caslin. I'd like to explain my yes vote. Please do. Uh, same Along the same lines as Senator Carpenter, him and I have been sitting over here talking, and uh, in no shape, form, or fashion do we want to hurt local banks, small businesses, those kind of things. Uh, and, and I've read this thing through and through trying to make sure that it doesn't mandate someone to lend to somebody. And after reading through, you know, there's still areas that uh, they can be denied financial lending based off of um, all the typical things that a bank would look at from a P&L statement to assets and things like mm -hmm. that. I think along the lines of what Jared said, maybe this is an encouragement to continue the conversation between the bank and the industry. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Senator Embry, Senator Harper Angel, Senator Schickel, Senator Southworth. Explain my vote, Mr. Chairman. Please do. Mr. Chairman, it's a rare day that I vote on a bill that I'm not 100% solid on. Um, there's a lot here, and I think that what I'm hearing description-wise is not exactly what I'm seeing in the language, but I do feel like this really needs to be in the Banking and Insurance Committee, to be honest, because I'm not on that committee for a reason. So I, I'm going to vote yes um, because what's been said in that we want to, you know, select the state should be able to select who they do business with. I think that's true. So I, I agree with that. There are some things here like we're going to presume that people have been put on notice about reports and, you know, treasurer is going to use their best judgment, no liability, they're exempt from things. All that kind of language starts worrying me, and I'd like the banking committee to look at that so that we really know what this is um, before we keep moving too far forward. But for right now, we'll be a yes. Senator Turner. Explain my vote, Mr. Chairman. Please explain. Um, I appreciate the bill that's been brought. I think it's got the attention of all of the state of Kentucky when these electric bills just went out the roof. And uh, I'm proud that the bills be brought at this time because you're talking about judiciary responsibility uh, and shareholders and voters versus voters. We are here to protect the voters of this state. And I'm proud that the banks that I own stock in now and got money in are being going to be named as kind of not in the business of taking, helping take care of Eastern Kentucky. And uh, I was in the mines helping my dad mine when I was a young boy and no mining, got mining property and uh, oil wells and what have you up there, guys well. So I don't want this opinion that uh, the examples you gave that this legislative body will react next week and pass some other bill uh, that you mentioned what they might do from guns to that. I, I don't think that that's appropriate this time because we're talking about the public of this state that sent us down here to protect them 
And the only way we can is what we're doing here today is enact legislation that says banks, you shareholders make all the money you want to. But if you're going to punish us, state voters, because you can't help finance coal or the industries we need to live every day and not get a $1,000 electric bill with, that maybe you shouldn't be asking us for our bank deposits. So it's a balancing act, but the only way the people of this state get some help is us by the acts we're taking. And I think this bill is very appropriate in starting that so that banks and the voters and us legislators can get on board and saying, first and foremost, we got to protect the people that we vote, get vote us here, that have to pay these bills every day, and you institutions that take our money in and make money off of us to pay your shareholders, and I'm a shareholder in a bank, I own stock in some, and one I'm surprised that uh, is in this, and I may remove all my stuff from that bank. So I'm proud to vote yes and I for this bill, and hope everybody can. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Senator Webb. I'm going to explain my vote as well, Mr. Please Chairman. Go I'm going to vote I as well. Um, I, there's no gentleman here that I have more respect for than Ballard Cassidy and John Cooper. And uh, I love my banks. I work well with all sizes in my district. And But, I, you know, we do have a problem. Um, Senator Wheeler pointed out the size and the control, lack of control locally or statewide or even regionally anymore, and decisions being made. You know, we're facing activism infiltration where the minority is making decisions for the corporate entities. Uh, if, you know, I'd, I'd like to have an amendment to include animal enterprises as well because that's happening too throughout parts of the nation and, and is a kind of a trend where infiltration of activism is dictating policy that does not help or speak for the majority. Uh, so we, we've got issues to address that are far more than, than social issues. These are signature industry, state bottom line, majority issues. Uh, that we have to make policy decisions on. So this is my statement piece as a former coal miner and um, general counsel uh, that employed a lot of people that's now gone. Uh, and so I'm going to vote yes at this time and hope that we work on policy to alleviate some of the problems that's been talked about today. Senator Westerfield. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, <clears throat> when I first read the bill, I had the same thoughts that you just mentioned here this morning. Uh, but after I, I read it and reread it, I, I don't think it, in fact, it preserves explicitly the fiduciary duty that the treasurer has uh, and that um, the Commonwealth has. It doesn't stop uh, banks or any other financial institutions from being able to do what they want. My, When I first started reading the bill, I thought, whoa, we're how does this going to work if we're going to stop them from being able to do anything? We're not stopping them from anything at all, except doing business with Kentucky. And in that regard, you're right. We're, we're taking a position here, but it's for an industry that helped build Kentucky and still helps fund and build Kentucky and that's still central to Kentucky that you're certainly familiar with. Um, I support it um, and appreciate um and welcome the, the market to do what it does, to let people make the decisions and weigh the risks of investing in, in fossil fuels or not, uh, if that's what they choose to do. And if and again, if this bill precluded them or stopped them from being able to, to make those decisions on their own, it, it would be a problem, but it doesn't do that. Uh, and at the end of the day, I certainly trust the words of our state treasurer, uh, whose expertise in this regard and her involvement in this bill not only from a drafting standpoint, but from a, a practical uh, enforcement standpoint, I, I trust her position and her role um, and her counsel on the bill. So I proudly vote aye. Senator Wheeler. Mr. Chairman, explain my aye vote. Please do. Um, you know, um, I, I think that we as, as senators have a fiduciary responsibility to the voters and the people working in our district. <clears throat> And uh, as part of that fiduciary duty is to set policy in a way that benefits them. 
and make sure that the industries that provide them with uh, secure livings, with jobs, with, with the ability to put food on their table is probably our highest fiduciary duty that we have. And, um, you know, uh, we are also stewards of the taxpayer's money. And if we want to invest our funds as a commonwealth in institutions that share our values, I think that, uh, that we as, as stewards and, and fiduciaries for the voters of Kentucky um, have both a, a responsibility and a, um, a duty to do that. Uh, I'm a proud co-sponsor of this resolution. I, I, like Mr. Casty, I hail from Pikeville. I proudly represent coal country and, and, and represent coal miners on a daily basis in my law practice. And, you know, uh, thankfully, we still have a very strong community bank at home and community trust that values the coal industry that uh, I think is a leader in that regard. But, you know, as far as the other banks, the city banks, the BB&Ts and stuff like that, there's a lot of my people that have been put out of work by some of these large policy that really have very limited options as to where they what they do business with. And, and I think we need to make a statement as a Commonwealth. I want to reaffirm my uh, support of our state treasurer to make the right decisions here. Uh, she's uh, very, been a great steward of, of our money as a Commonwealth, and I would I proudly support this measure. Chair Smith. Yeah, explain vote. Uh, I think that uh, our banking uh, community has done a fantastic job. I think you have a, a history of tradition of, of being on the right side of many of these big issues and something that we should be proud of. Uh, but for us as state senators and having to widen our gaze, uh, our job is to protect the interests of the citizens and businesses of the Commonwealth to, to any threat, whether that be an outside threat or wherever it is, it's our job to stand up and try to make sure that those individuals and those investments are treated treated fairly um, my question is is that when you start looking at saying you're not going to do business with oil and gas you're not going to do business now we understand they've, they've reached out and it's starting to be religious organizations I heard a rumor through the grapevine that maybe even like Asbury College could be denied participation by these institutes that decide they no longer want to to be involved with uh, with Christian organizations. And if you look around the Capitol today, you'll see a lot of people with the ash uh, on their forehead as a sign of their, their faith. But my question is, at what point do they put somebody in that group that, that you all of a sudden start disagreeing with? Uh, I think this precedence they've set uh, by being able to target and isolate out one of Kentucky's signature industries, and now they're moving on to religious groups uh, and I'm very, very proud of, of Asbury College and other colleges that we've got that have a religious background. And I will tell you, if I, this turns out to be true, you will really see this committee react uh, in a very strong way. But, you know, this is a dangerous precedent to set at a time when they're trying to use their, their banking to steer international policy. And then you look at what's going on in Russia right now. Uh, well, we need our, our president to, to turn loose the energy production of this nation. We need to quit buying this oil over there, and we should have one of the best energy policies we've got and let Kentucky rise to the demand to protect our investments. So um, very, very proud of our banking uh, organization. You all had to come here. You had to come down here and stand up for the people that put you in those positions. It's the same thing with us. We have to come down here and take a position that lets the Kentucky industry know that when we feel like you've been mistreated or you're singled out and there's no stopping them from what they, they pick next, uh, when they start getting into religious organizations and then spread to other stuff, uh, it'll probably affect you all personally like it's affecting us. This kind of s sectioning people out to punish them because you disagree with them has got to stop. And so I, I'm proud of this particular bill uh, and appreciate the support of this committee. And so I vote eye on the bill uh, and so Senate Bill 205 as amended by the committee substitute uh, passes with the same expression uh, so with that said gentlemen thank you all very much thank that. you Mr. Thank Chairman. My members. Mr. Chairman members of the committee thank you and thank you for your comments and your time <coughs> now at this time uh, we should have some representatives from the cabinet are they here uh, Katie uh, if you wanted to go ahead and come up to the table. Katie, do you have anybody with you? or?
Uh, Katie, welcome. If you would, if you all could identify your yourself for our records, please. Sure, Anthony Ellis, uh, General Counsel for the Cabinet for Economic Development. Good morning, Katie Smith, Deputy Secretary, Commissioner for the Cabinet for Economic Development. Thanks, Anthony. I feel I've talked to you so many times. It's really nice to kind of put a, <laughs> a face to it. We just want you guys to give us a quick update. Uh, we have, have had obviously heard from Core Scientific, and they have presented us with a timeline and uh, of, of how uh, their company making significant investments in the western part of the state uh, and have done so based upon the success of the, the legislation passed by this uh, General Assembly last year and um, are, are explaining to us that they're having difficulty, great difficulty in being able to utilize a program uh, that we put together. And I know in the summer uh, there was a question about what my intent was and I reached over not only called but uh, also sent a letter explaining that my intent was clear in the legislation that if you meet these steps that we really want you all uh, to be able to to utilize these so you can continue to create jobs here in the state of Kentucky uh, but we just had some questions from some of our members as to what's going on with the program and uh, and maybe tell us you know how you know why would this fail why would there be so many attempts to That's utilize a program right. and and then be denied okay um, I'm happy to kind of give you an update on where we are with the program so after the legislation, there was a couple pieces of legislation approved through last year's General Assembly. We started receiving a lot of inquiries uh, regarding the program. <laughs> and so we actually, I'm going to share our screen. Whitney, yeah. We created a, a fact sheet because of the amount of inquiries we were receiving. It's available on our website. So this web page shows all of the incentive programs. And this is kind of our only fact sheet that we have devoted to one specific industry, the cryptocurrency projects. And so when you click on it, it takes you to the fact sheet. And because we were getting lots of inquiries about the different programs and the dis different resources that are available for cryptocurrency projects. So what we did was you can see we have our Select Kentucky site. So if they're looking for various sites, they can go to that website and put in kind of their specifics. If they're looking for a, a certain amount of acres or a certain size building, and then also they were talking to us about utilities and so we have a, a link to the different utility providers and the service provider map uh, sustainable resource programs we put that on here as well and then the programs that are administered by our cabinet we put out here as well uh, which prior to last year we had our kentucky business investment program it's our kind of our more popular program that we use for new investment new job creation and our kentucky enterprise initiative act program as well those were available to cryptocurrency projects. Yeah, Katie, if I could just point out that I, that is one of the letters I kept getting this summer from other companies. They had reached out about this, and this this bill picked up, was on podcast, and obviously went all over the, the nation, which you all saw, and it was a nice win for us. But from what they're telling me is that when they would call you and ask about the program, you all kept redirecting them to some of these older programs that were not what they were interested in, but they said that, that it kind of, they felt like it was being pushed on them, if I could say. Okay. Uh, well, we were talking to them in, about and explaining the different programs. We explained the KBI, we explained the Kia, and then we were explaining the Incentives for Energy Business, or Energy Related Businesses Act, which we now call IEBA. Um, and prior to IEBA, it was Incentives for Energy Independence Act. And under that IEA is what we called that one. I'm so sorry for the acronyms, but under that program, it was uh, it wasn't as friendly with speed to market because you have to you cannot start spending any money under that program until after preliminary approval, after final approval, and after the activation date. So that takes time. So when companies are wanting to move really really quickly, we were recommending the KBI and Kia programs because you can get your approval and you can immediately start spending money. And so those that's what we were talking to them about because they were needing to start moving fairly quickly and having to wait two, three, four months or longer under that IEBA program was not. And here's, an, I don't really understand, um, because when we looked at this, this is, uh, I think Senator Webb and I are probably the only ones that were here when we did. This is the, the carryover from House Bill 1, where we really tried to, to do this years ago and, and, and had nobody take us up on it. It was a great idea, and we simply <laughs> modernized that to sort of catch what was happening in the industry for Kentucky. But when I look at this, the speed of deployment, there, a lot of this stuff is you all have the power in each one of those decisions making to go ahead and approve these people if they've met the criteria. And farther than that, you know, we really specifically put in there 
what that criteria must be. So if there's a delay, or you're saying it's taking them longer to do that, do we need to change this bill? Yes. Do, do we need to make some amendments and change it? Because that's what I think uh, the purpose was when we when we sent it out here for people to be able to use it. And we've heard all summer how they can't use it, and they've been redirected to other programs. So we just we want to know what we have to do to make this work. They are not permitted to start incurring any qualifying expenditures until after the activation date. That's the problem with the speed to market and not being because they cannot start spending any money. And that's the way that that is really why we moved, we sunsetted the IEA program and made those projects all eligible under the KBI and KIA program. But we'd be happy to work with you on trying to make it easier for those, pro those projects to access. Um, and some of the projects when they were sp speaking with us though, uh, we would connect them because we were trying to get their locations. They may not have locations. We would uh, connect them with locals and with the utility providers uh, so that they can make sure they had the local support. And also the, the utility providers had the uh, capacity to be able to support the loads. Because I know not just in cryptocurrency, but in several industries right now, that is um, a factor where the utility companies are looking at current loads and potential future loads and assisting the project. So we are, while when they go and have those discussions, we're waiting for companies and projects to, to come back to us and talk to us. There was also a little bit of confusion between the IEBA program and the revenue program because one is the sales and use tax refund on the uh, on the electricity. And so we are, and that's why we have that on this fact sheet as well. So we are when we get the calls and that's what they're asking about, we are referring those inquiries over to the Department of Revenue as well so they can work with those projects. So um, sometimes when they're calling, they say IEBA, but when they talk about the explanation of the, the credit they're looking for, it's it's actually the, the revenue incentive. Would it be better for us if we, and we're working on some, some language actually as we speak, to move this over to revenue? I mean, is this something that needs to maybe, is it is it in the right cabinet, I guess, or? Uh, is because this stuff is changing, like you said, the power companies uh, uh, met with me recently and, and they were, said, Brandon, why don't you let us know it was going to be this crazy? Well, honestly, we, we had no idea. Uh, we knew it was, it was a chance to position the rural parts of, e of Kentucky, both eastern and western, uh, that had, because of the loss of the coal industry, they had the electrical gear, they had the places on the ground that they were looking for, and it's done that. It's ignited a, a tremendous market you've seen what's happened to coal in the state of kentucky it's it's gone probably beyond our dreams for what it could do but it's been so crazy i know it's a lot to manage but just the fact that i <laughs> think is, that this it's just yeah. one of several that we have but that we're happy to help um although if you're asking us whether you want to take this program and give it to a different cabinet with significantly more employees and a budget that is <laughs> tenfold ours I think on behalf of my fiduciary duty to the cabinet, I have to say we're definitely open to that discussion. <laughs> I mean, we're happy to help. And we, we, we've talked about this extensively. I mean, I think we, we hear your passion and, and desire to and see the opportunity here. But it's just, I think, the program. I think it depends on how you want to structure the program. If you want it to be a, a straight exemption, then that's what revenues programs are. If you want it to have a cap and require negotiations and approvals and so that they don't automatically get it or, or we want to cap it or we want to negotiate the incentive amount. So even they may be eligible, say, for a million dollars, but we want to just only offer them $500,000, then that's more housed at our cabinet. So. Well, I think when we're working with Representative Rudy on it, there was the, you know, we wanted this to be for the bigger customers to come in and not just have somebody out of their house, you know, with 10 or 15 units. So that's why you had the million dollar right. cap and stuff like that. So I do think we, we want to put a value on it. Uh, we want to make sure that we have the larger players in it that come and bring the employees with them. Uh, and this is just a first step in it, which for me is that once this is established, that we know that there's the back office side of the tokens, the protocols, and those are even more jobs for us. So when we're going to be creating these, these coins and opportunity in the state of Kentucky, as I uh, keep telling Ballard and them, which they're ready to run me off, that we should be structured to capture this and manage this uh, inside of our own boundaries. So there's this is kind of like connecting the dots for us as far as emerging technology, and it's red hot right now, and Kentucky's position to do it, and yet I think to date nobody's ever gotten this.
program. They've never received the incentive from Senate Bill 255. No, but Correct. we have had one that was approved under KBI, and then we have had a couple that actually chose to move forward with their projects without requesting incentives. So. Okay, well, we do I have any questions? Uh, I, this is a sort of a Western kind of Kentucky issue that I was brought into. It was Senate with uh, Representative Rudy some time ago. Had, had had me come down and, and meet with them, and I think it's been success for them. We'd love to replicate it in Eastern Kentucky, especially with the, the issue of they had the surplus power and needed to do something with that. And it's been the same thing for us. So um, we, we have interest in, in different ways. But do, do I have any of my members that have questions or would like to? Senator Castle. I just kind of like to echo what you said and, and, you know, in a way that we can continue to find out how to get these folks to settle. I know in the Western Kentucky region, they're very interested in it and with the abundant amount of power and stuff, I think it would be good. So hopefully we can come to a conclusion on this. Very good. And seeing no other comments from the members, uh, do you all have any closing comments? No, sir. Happy to come and address any questions. If you all have any questions, please feel free to reach out. And if we want to work on some improvements to the program, please reach out. We're, we're happy to do that. I think we're probably going to do that post-haste. But anyhow, 